Okay, I'll try and keep this one quick because there's a, a large slide deck. Let's go into some of the things that we do with our clients, which is kind of analyze latest market trends and have a look at uh, what, what is moving financial markets and, and kind of try and pick out the themes that, that allow us to go and select some, some winning stocks. And I've got, I've got two for you today, I hope to be winning stocks. I think these are meant to be bold predictions, so they'll be my bold predictions for today. So just to, just to look at the trends, I mean, you, you can hardly, I think the last time I spoke uh, in the Power Hour forum was, was, was a year and a half ago. And uh, I mean, obviously that was just after the, the, the pandemic had, had uh, they broken. I think part of the introduction was that this is how are we handling the post-pandemic world. And I suppose the question is, are we really in a post-pandemic world? Because looking at the, the case numbers, um, you know, we get a sense that from the financial market point of view, from, from an investment point of view, everyone kind of wants, wants to put COVID in the Europe. We're never going to go back to those, those heavy lockdowns. I think everyone's realized they can't afford it. With, with the, the vaccine rollouts, uh, you know, as uh, BioNTech, which is the partner uh, of the Pfizer, the Pfizer vaccine, uh, has said in, in that headline that I put up on the screen, COVID will become manageable. And I think that's the, the attitude from financial markets. But, but the fact is that case numbers are still dropping, but we are going to have a lot of variants. Um, we hope that the variants that come through, I mean, the UK is going through a very aggressive variant now. We can see that its numbers, uh, its case numbers are not dropping at all. Um, it, it, uh, we hope that the variants become almost less less dangerous, uh, even though they become more contagious. That, that's kind of the, 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 the feeling that, uh, that you get from the experts. But uh, the feeling from financial markets certainly is that, yes, we, we understand the pandemic. We, we've now had a good look at the pandemic. We understand the volatility that it's creating in, in the underlying economy in terms of supply chain disruptions and uh, you know all, all the, the kind of havoc that the lockdowns have created. And now that we understand it, we can kind of more accurately price it. And you know, you find that whenever you're dealing with financial markets, financial markets are, are, are predictions of, of future price actions. So um, it's uh, you know, once you have a have a, a known, it, it becomes priced into the stock. So the idea that we're through the pandemic, I think, from a from a, an actual real world point of view, the world has changed dramatically. But from a financial market point of view, I think you can push it uh, a little bit more to the background. Um, looking at it, so I'm just looking at okay, so I'm going to look at financial markets and then I'm going to look at, at uh, economics, so two, two slightly different areas. So the first is just the global market performance uh, separated out by, by economies. So this is all rebased to, to dollars. And you can see again over the last year what's really happened in, in, in the, I suppose, the geographic spread of, of how, um, how financial markets are priced differently is we've seen that there's been a huge divergence uh, uh, in China from, from global peers. So initially, when, when the recovery really started to, to get hold, uh, we saw South Africa way ahead of, of the rest of the world. We were recovering a lot quicker. And part of that was because of this big boost up in commodity prices that were helping to make our mining firms incredibly profitable. Um, we saw it across the board, and, and that's because of our boss specifically is so uh, concentrated in mining, mining securities. Um, we saw this enormous recovery in South African markets. Anyone invested in, you know, a top 40 ETF was was smiling. You were beating the US. You were beating every other market in in, in, in the world. Um, what started to happen then is we started to see the divergence in China. Now, part of this was due to the regulatory crackdown. So, if you remember. Um, it all started just about a year ago, exactly. So, you know, I think it was on the second of November. We had uh, we, we were kind of preparing for for the, the one of the biggest IPOs in the world uh, from from Ant Financial, and uh, you know we had the idea that there, there was this, you know Jack Ma's new business was going to come to market, and uh, the Chinese regulatory authorities essentially scuppered the deal. Now there was a whole lot of different reasons uh, for this. A lot of people are now putting it down to the the Chinese ruling party wants more control. But um, but essentially, what happened is uh, that that precipitated the beginning of uh, of, a, of a wide crackdown across Chinese sectors. So uh, you know, when it, when it first happened, everyone was saying it was because Jack Ma spoke out, uh, you know, uh, you know, against Beijing and, and, and their policies. And, and then, if you remember, he disappeared for a couple of months. Um, Essentially, that that whole that whole situation was really just the beginning of, of a, a far broader crackdown in China. Um, we've seen it now in the, the private education space. I mean, with the stroke of a pen, they essentially lights out the private education sector. And you know, you know, the, the reasons are beginning everything from from kind of antitrust to data security to to you know, uh, you know. 
essentially trying to combat uh, inequality in China. I remember, as a developed, as as uh, as a more developed, I would say fully developed, but a more developed uh, economy, uh, China still has one of the highest Gini coefficients. Gini coefficient being the me measure between rich and poor uh, in the world, and uh, and one of the reasons for the crackdowns that has been to you know to try and narrow that gap. At least the reasons given by by Beijing is uh, that they're trying to narrow that uh, that spread. Um, all of this has resulted in, in very poorly performing Chinese markets. Um, what we have seen over the last, uh, say, month or so, uh, so I'll go to five years in a second, but um, the last month or so, last, say, say, three months, we've seen a big resurgence in, in, in the um, and the European stocks as well. So the European, especially France, has, has actually performed exceptionally well. Um, this is just a comparison over the last month. You can see September, we had a lot of volatility creeping into the system. Um, October, we've had a big rebound. The problem is without the commodity rebound, uh, and because commodity prices are still suffering a little bit, uh, you might have seen you know, the likes of the US down 4.6% 4, 4 last month. The US is rebounding 7%, this much largely driven by those big tech players and a really, really strong earnings season. Um, South Africa, we haven't rebounded. So we, we dropped almost 8% uh, in September. Um, we're you know, almost up a percent for October, up 0.81% in October. So uh, we're struggling without that without those higher commodity prices. The South African market is, is going through a difficult phase. Um, if I just take it back a little bit further, uh, so if we look over five years, the, the clear winner here is the US. So uh, any, any stocks with US exposure, US listed, listed companies really have been the place to be over the last five years. And again, so much of, uh, of that has been driven by the, the innovative tech-based companies, and I'll show you a, a, a heat map in a second. South Africa, again, reduced to a constant currency, so South African performance in, in US dollars. We are essentially flat over the last five years. We, we have had a very, very difficult uh, difficult road in, in, our, in, our, in our local financial markets. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that. Part of it is you know, the cyclical nature of commodities. Part of it is uh, you know, just the, the regulatory um, system that we live under. And part of it is ESCOM and, and, power, uh, and the power concerns that we have. Um, but a lot of it as well is just that, uh, especially in our small and mid-cap cases, our companies just don't seem to be able to achieve the valuations uh, in, 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 the, in the listed space that, uh, that they can, uh, that they would have if they, if they were listed on a foreign exchange. And we've seen countless examples of that. We've seen countless examples uh, in the last uh, couple of years of big of foreign money coming into South Africa to essentially buy out our small and mid-cap uh, sector. You've got the likes of Adapt IT and the Valaris deal. You've got Heineken looking, looking for Pastel. The, the, the list goes on and on and on. And this really is maybe not, not a case of South African companies not, um, you know, being good businesses, but rather South African companies are not just not achieving the valuations that they could if they were listed in a, in, in a, in a, different, in a different environment. Um, so to just show you where, where the performance has come from in the US, you can kind of see where it's coming from, certainly over the last year or so as well. Uh, I mean, Google up 78%, Tesla up almost almost 200%. Uh, there's a couple of pockets of, 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 of weakness there, but uh, you know, the rally has been very, very broad based um, you know, in, in the recovery from COVID. But, but, but the focus really on, on those big mega cap stocks, those FANG stocks is, is where, where investors are piling into. Now, is that valid or isn't that valid? So, like I said, financial markets really just look at uh, you know where we think assets are priced. It's, it's a prediction of the future. Um, whereas if you look at the economics, this is you know kind of backward looking, but this is actually what's happening in, in the real world. So I'm just going to do a US US economy compared to the South African economy, and you can kind of see that I've just picked four metrics on on each. Uh, well, we're going to look at the same four metrics across the two economies. What has happened post-pandemic? We've seen that inflation has jumped up significantly. Um, you know, the Fed, if you if you are a Fed watcher, has been telling us that this inflation picture is transitory. They're saying that this little kick up in, in, in the price of goods and services is really due to you know, supply chains. You can't lock down economies and go through one of the, the largest economic sh shocks in, I think the largest economic shock in living, in living memory anyway, um, and just come out uh, with everything being rosy. And, and the idea is that, uh, you know, as prices creep up, especially from, you know, wage prices, uh, you know, consumer goods prices, they don't fall back as quickly. But um, the Fed had the idea that once uh, things got back to normal, you would see, uh, you know, price stability returning and you'd see that inflation rate coming down. We obviously had uh, the announcement that we were going to get taper for the taper last night as well. So, so the Fed is going to start winding down this bond buying program, which was the, the, the uh, aggressive uh, monetary stimulus policies that they had put in place over, uh, over the pandemic period. That's now starting to end. 
Um, but yeah, the, the inflation has remained very, very sticky. Now, the, the base case from the, the, the central banks overseas is that uh, inflation will moderate. So the, the general level of, you know, we're not going to continue to see, see uh, prices increasing uh, as we have. Uh, our view in house is that uh, we will we will see some moderation over time, uh, but we don't think that we're getting back to those those ultra low um, inflation that ultra low inflation situation that we had pre pandemic. Uh, we do think that the world has changed somewhat. When inflation creeps into the system, uh, it's very it, it's very easy for inflation to become entrenched. Now, uh, to understand that, I mean, we were chatting a lot in our investment committee meeting this morning. Um, you know, there's stories in the U.S. of, of, of you know, especially with wage price inflation. So when you're looking at wage price inflation, the stories in the U.S. of literally McDonald's workers that are going to earn more than a million rand a year um, as, a, as almost a low skill job. Now, the reason for that is there's this huge labor shortage in the U.S. And you can see the unemployment rate, the spike in unemployment uh, that we got over the pandemic is that all was furloughed, um, the stimulus checks started going out. That has reversed very, very quickly. And the U.S. is quickly getting back to that full employment. Now, uh, the central bankers in the U.S. think of, you know, they've got almost a new conception of what we term what we call frictional unemployment, which is unemployment, uh, you know, there's always going to be a natural level of unemployment in any economy. So the frictional unemployment is essentially when you're at full employment, there's still a number that is that is representing unemployment um, you know we, the, the idea was that frictional employment should have should have been around four and a half percent but just pre-pandemic I've got the chart going back that far, uh, far uh, you had unemployment well below four uh, percent in the US so that almost changed the conception of what you could have in terms of uh, a frictional unemployment rates so uh, the Fed is very focused on getting back there but what it's creating is this almost a shortage of labor and, and you see wage price inflation coming into the system now when wages go up they don't come back I mean anyone who's run a business knows this um, you know once you once you give raises you can't take raises away yes to an extent you can see a moderation in consumer prices, you know, especially with technology. You know, when you go and you know, with, with the technological improvements, the price of your big flat screens, TVs comes down. Yes, that can moderate. But you know, in the second hand car market, which is one that uh, Jerome Powell often points to when he talks about transitory inflation, he says, ah, oh, but you know, it's only because there's chip shortages and supply chain issues and new cars aren't being manufactured. So the second hand market is under pressure, but you know, market dynamics will play out and, and prices will, will get back to usual. You know, at the same time, there's this, this idea that, that maybe they won't. Yes, they will. You, you know, the system will start to run properly again, but there's no way that those prices are good. You're not suddenly going to be able to get cars for cheaper than you, you would if you just wait uh, a year. We're not going to move towards a deflationary environment. So the price increases that we've seen, you'll see a moderation, but I don't see them coming down. Um, also, if you look at kind of what's happening in the US, that, you know, we got a miss on, on last month's uh, GDP growth rate number as well. Things are difficult, but People are employed. Fed is starting to taper, and there is a situation where we are going to see you know, higher interest rates. The reading from the meeting last night certainly was that um, you would have a, a situation in which the, um, uh, the interest rates are, are probably you, the Fed at least they, they made the distinction between uh, the end of taper and the, the start of an increase in interest rates. So you can see in the bottom right hand chart, um, you know, for many years we've been at a, you know we've had the zero bound problem, which is essentially interest rates just can't fall any further. We're there at the moment we've started the taper, but they are indicating that this doesn't mean that we're going to see a lift in the, in the federal fund. But if we move across to South Africa quickly, you can see that the annual inflation rate here is, is really tracking the same. Remember, South Africa is a small open economy, so we import inflation from overseas. When commodity prices, the raw materials go up, um, you know, the price of our goods and services go up. So many of our consumer goods as well are, are imported. Um, we are, we are uh, to an extent, uh, um, beholden to, to what happens in the international economy. The, the difference between the two is you can clearly see the, the unemployment rate in South Africa is not uh, the same as in the US, while the inflation rate might be the same. Uh, unemployment is, is just an unmitigated disaster. There's no question about that. We need growth at all costs. Um, in order to solve our unemployment problem. The problem is we can't get growth because, and, and our growth has been very, very flat, and we can, can't get growth largely because of the, the, the energy constraints at the moment. Now, there are uh, optimistic signs, uh, you, you know, uh, on the energy front, uh, but for now, I think you've got to be realistic and, and look at it and say that we, you know, our, our growth rate in South Africa is going to be constrained for some time until we solve the, the ESCOM problem, which is not an easy solve. Um, the repo rate in South Africa, we are leaving the repo rate a, a little bit lower if you compare us to, to other emerging market peers. Um, a lot of other emerging markets have started to hike interest rates already. So the next move for here is clearly going to be higher. I'm not going to try and uh, predict where the, the timing of the, the next interest 
demonstrate how that is effective. Me. But uh, for us, it is important to understand that when you're making an investment, you've got to cater for an environment where there's higher inflation and higher interest rates. That means if you're looking at companies that are heavily indebted, be a little bit more cautious. If you are looking at putting money into fixed deposits at this stage, maybe not the best time to do this. We're at kind of a, a trough in the rate cycle. And uh, you know, having a little bit more flexibility uh, will probably be a, a good thing going forward. A uh, quick chart just on the VIX. So uh, volatility uh, on the S&P 500, that's volatility, S&P 500 versus the, the volatility index. Volatility is dropping big time. So we write down at the bottom of the channel um, after that little wobble, which was, seems like a great execution uh, point, a great uh, point to deploy new market, uh, new cash overseas. Um, we're always all, almost back at uh, record highs, and we've seen a big, big uh, sort of subsidence in, in, in the, the attitude towards risk. Um, quickly, I'm going to do currencies and commodities. I uh, want to the stock picks as well. So, currencies and commodities. Uh, currency markets at the moment. So, currencies are interesting. One always very, very difficult to predict. So, what I've got up for you on the right hand side is the latest polls. Uh, Reuters has a poll every month. So, it's a monthly poll. Uh, this one came out on the 2nd of November. So, uh, basically two days ago. Um, and it polls all the big international banks. Now, why is that important? It's, it's important because these banks then feed that information through to their clients. It's also the information they use to make the decisions um, on, on their own internal uh, mechanics. So um, it's always a good idea to keep an eye on just how the banks are feeling about it. This was a surprisingly small poll. I normally do a webinar once a month where we go through the currency polls. Um, you know, normally you have more than 20 analysts polled. This month we only have 15 analysts polls. And, and, and strangely, the, the South African banks only named that was actually giving a currency prediction. Um, they, this is a one-year currency prediction on the bottom right-hand side. Um, near bank, you know, hardly any move from, from last month. Uh, near bank still sees that the 12-month uh, forecast for the RAND dollar rate should be around 15, uh, 15.72. Uh, we're currently sitting at, uh, at 59. And I did the slide this morning where 15.28, but following the, the take the news overnight, we've seen the currency firming up uh, uh, quite, quite, uh, quite nicely over, over the, the course of today. So I think we're down at about 15.15 at the moment. Um, I've got a smart estimate up there. A smart estimate is a lot stronger. That kind of uh, takes into account all the different predictions. Median estimates are across all 15 analysts uh, is currently sitting around 15.10. So you have seen that people who like the, the median, uh, so, so if you look at the, looking at the group, um, analysts are a little bit more bullish. On from where the currency is currently. Um, we're seeing a, a divergence. And normally you see the banks kind of moving together based on news. Uh, so this is the first month that we've seen them actually, not the first month, but it, this month at least, they are, they are giving very, very different forecasts. So you see Morgan Stanley becoming a lot more bullish. Uh, moving its, its target price from last month from 15.28 down to 14.78. Uh, at the same time, we've seen Julius Bear becoming more bearish. So it's moving from 15.50 up to about 16.20. So uh, Goldman Sachs is unchanged. They are by far the most optimistic uh, bank on the local currency. Uh, they have got a, 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 a target of 1280. Now, what this also, also gives you, and that's why I always put the minimum max in, and if you're looking for a range of currency, if you're going to transfer any amount, if you're looking at whether you should be buying RAND hedge stocks or you should be buying SA Inc. stocks, uh, there's always that kind of playoff in our local market. It's, it's a good idea to, to know where the currency is at any time and where the outside of the range is. So the range on, on, on big bank estimates currently is 1280 to, to 1620. Uh, with us up at about 50, you call it 15, 15, 15, 20, uh, we are starting to get to towards the top of the range. Um, I've done a little bit of technicals on the left-hand side for you. Um, and you can see we've had this uh, horizontal support in place for a while. Uh, we've seen the, the exit certainly for, from our clients. So the ex exits at about uh, 14 40. That's where people are using our treasury service. 14 40 to 14 80. That's where we're shipping money out. Um, anything about kind of 15 20, we're bringing money back in. So we've got a whole lot of people that work overseas, uh, you know, uh, companies that have international payments. Uh, we bring, bring money back at that rate. So that seems to be the range on, on the local currency at the moment, uh, just, just based uh, against the uh, US dollar. Uh, longer term, uh, we've got that kind of little bowl formation there. I think longer term, you probably are looking at a weakening. The idea that we're going to weaken back to 19 in the short term, I think, is unlikely. Uh, our currency is very, very determined by commodity prices. So if you overlay a commodity chart, a general commodity price index over a RAND chart, you'll see that the correlation is very, very high. Uh, but the idea that we're going to get to 19 in the short term, I think, is you know, I wouldn't be too pessimistic either. One, the banks aren't that pessimistic. And two, remember that our currency is seen as a risky uh, asset. 
So when people are buying South African Rand, it's generally a risk on environment. We've just gone through the biggest e economic shock in living memory. That was a panic stations, total panic stations. Uh, and, and of course, when that happens, uh, you're going to see money pulling out of risky assets, uh, heading to the safe havens. That's why you've got this exaggerated movement in, in, in our currency. Um, I, would, I wouldn't go and look for highs in the short term. Uh, it would be my view on currency. Maybe that's one of the bold predictions that I was meant to be giving you guys. Um, commodity markets. Uh, so a quick, quick look at commodities. Uh, you can see the last year, you can see clearly what's happened in, in, in commodity prices. The, the trend is still in, intact, uh, but we have had a moderation over the last couple of months. We've seen a, a little bit of a stabilization over the last two months and, and commodity prices starting to starting to come off a little bit. Um, and it's, it's interesting because it depends on, you know, the, this is the, the Reuters Commodity Index and the Bloomberg Commodity Index. You can obviously track each other very closely, uh, but you get, you get the picture of what's happened over the last uh, the last year. Now, part of that was, uh, okay, so, so that's, that's the general picture of all commodities. So I've just now stripped out a couple of uh, the commodity uh, areas for you. I think the base metals in which would have been interesting as well. But uh, oil performance, LCOC1, that is uh, very crude oil. And you can see, you know, there's obviously all sorts of different types of oil. You've got the, you know, West Texas Intermediate. You've got, uh, you know, Wyoming Asphalt Sour. There's all these different oil contracts in the world, depending on where the oil is situated and the quality of the oil and the you know how, how how close to petrol it is and how much it is just dirty might have a bit of oil in it um, so different contracts trade at different prices but you can see the correlation has been quite close um, the environment in the oil market at the moment uh, it looks like it would be the um, uh, Iran, uh, Iran is back at the, the talks about the nuclear program, uh, which could potentially release more supply into, into the market. Uh, that's why we've seen a little bit of a moderation in, in oil prices over the last uh, couple of days. Uh, we've also got Biden, you know, green energy Biden, telling uh, OPEC that he would like to see a lot more supply coming on stream because, of course, oil is a massive input to inflation. And, and I think uh, both fiscal and monetary authorities are starting to get a little bit concerned about uh, about where oil prices are sitting. Uh, my personal view, uh, you know, we've got quite a split view on oil on, on, on our desk, but uh, my view on oil is, you know, when it was down at $20, $30 a barrel, you had to, had to be in, in the uh, We had Slavoj and Exxon Mobil, and we were buying direct oil contracts overseas as well. When you could get them, obviously you couldn't get them when they traded negative. The, the pricing was just impossible because we were kind of almost reaching what's called tank tops, where not tank tops that you put on, but tank tops where there was no more place to store oil. So getting derivative contracts on oil was incredibly difficult. Um, but now at $80 a barrel, I think this is the, the level where, where you will see a stabilization. I mean, like I said, the view is quite diverse uh, on the day, uh, on our desk. Uh, my view though is, is between sort of uh, 75 and 85. I don't think you're going to get too much above $90 a barrel in any sustained fashion. Um, and I think that uh, from here, we probably will see a moderation, more oil coming on stream. Uh, OPEC, remember, doesn't really want oil at $200 a barrel because it will accelerate the move from uh, from dirty old uh, dirty old internal combustion engines to the the, the BEVs, so the, the battery powered electric vehicles, or, or just alternative energy sources. So um, they, it is in their interest not to allow oil to go up because they obviously are, are profit maximizer, like uh, most people in financial markets. Um, the power complex. So you guys would have heard all about the uh, the, the problems uh, overseas. Uh, especially in Europe, uh, that's natural gas. We've got uh, Trappers uh, coal contract. Um, you can see also coal prices and natural gas prices are moderating. Uh, softs, very, very diverse softs. So, so these, these two softs, sorry, the, these, the codes are terrible for you. These are two coffee contracts. Coffee, coffee prices just going through the roof. Rubber prices actually down. Uh, on, on the day, these two silver and gold ones over here are sugar, uh, sugar kind of moderately up. Uh, quick, quick chart on the Baltic dry index, so just that this kind of speaks to supply chain management and, and the little uh, fall off in uh, commodity prices. Um, massive, massive drop off in, in the Baltic dry index. Uh, the index basically factors in the rates of Cape Size, Panamax, and Supermax uh, shipping vessels, so it's a, it's, it's a gauge of the rates that you get on shipping. Um, you know, shipping price is falling. Well, why is that? Because one, uh, not, not as much dry bulk is moving but also uh, just volatility is in the system and, and, and you've got to understand that when you when we go through a shock like this an economic system can handle it but, but there's going to be uncertainty and uncertainty breeds uh, volatility um, okay, on to stock picks. Okay, so I'm just run over time because I want to leave some space for questions as well so I'm going to do two quick stock picks. 
Uh, first one, Sabani Slowwater. Um, I love this stock. I've been <laughs> I've been planting it for a long time. Uh, what does it do? So Sabani Slowwater. It spun out of gold fields years ago. It used to be called Sabani Gold. Um, it's PGM and uh, gold miner, but they are now moving aggressively into the, the kind of uh, Modern battery minerals, uh, things like uh, lithium, uh, nickel, you're quickly on the red and EPS chart on the left hand side. You can see uh, in 2020 with a commodity rally and uh, everything kind of moving up there, they had uh, some pretty spectacular earnings uh, dropping through. I uh, remember that uh, mining companies often have, uh, you know, they all have uh, huge operating leverage, they've got these big fixed costs, and when the commodity prices spike, suddenly all of that uh, additional revenue just drops straight through the income statement onto, onto the bottom line, and they are wildly, wildly. Our profitable part of that is uh, reflected in a massive dividend yield because they're paying special dividends at the moment. They want special dividends, but they're just paying a, an outsized dividend. Um, over five year return, 120%, you've more than doubled your money. You've done, uh, you've done really reasonably well if you've been invested in Sabania, but it is a very, very volatile stock. Um, it's led by Neil Froneman, who's 61 years old, he's been in the position for nine years. Uh, and the track record at, of management at, at Sabania has been absolutely exceptional. I'm going to kind of skip a few slides and just go here, we can go back. But this is this is one of the reasons that, that uh, I, I like management and uh, kind of saw back in today. I mean, they, Remember, they were doing a whole lot of very interesting things when these are the PGM prices that you're looking at. So this is the PGM basket of gold. And it was nowhere in 2015, 2016. And that is a very difficult time to be doing deals. Um, what were they doing? They bought out the Aquarius and Rustenburg uh, mines from, from Anglo American, or Aquarius, and then the, the Rustenburg mines from Anglo American Platinum. Uh, when everyone was like, Oh, but those are terrible mines. You know, they've got labor issues. And there's no, you know, like it's just never going to work. Um, they bought them. They, what they did is, you know, they're very, very clever about it. They essentially just consolidated mines that should have always been one mine, but were three or four mines. So they took out all the excess management. You have three management teams instead of one management team. They put in one management team, knocked down all the fences. You have one system running an all body instead of multiple systems, and it works really, really well. They then did the stormwater transaction, which was pretty scary at the time. Um, if they didn't get that PGM, Pick up, uh, it would have been a bit of a problem, but then they get the backing and the funding to do it. The debt went off the charts, but obviously uh, everything played ball. Uh, the Lonman transaction also fantastic. I mean, they got Lonman basically for free. They got an amazing smelter in that deal as well. Very, very savvy uh, management team that knows the, knows the business of mining very, very well. They timed the commodity cycle perfectly and they have reaped the rewards massively from a small spin off uh, from gold fields. Uh, into basically a, a massive uh, company with uh, almost uh, 85,000 employees um, and uh, and some serious production. Their whole mix has changed. Uh, so I've got the mix numbers down there for you as well. Uh, so USPGMs, which is the soil water transaction, uh, plus the SAPGMs, still, still making up the majority of the assets, but starting to move into lithium in Europe. Uh, they've just recently bought uh, assets in Brazil as well. Um, price targets, uh, you know, this is nice. This is a nice one because it's, uh, you know, because it's also got an ADR listed in uh, the US. Uh, you get decent coverage of this company as well. So we've got 12 institutional analysts covering it, and that means that we get active price discovery on the stock in my opinion. Um, price targets around 78 uh, to, to 78 to 81 depending on, on where you work, but significantly higher than where we are today, uh, which is around 55 rand per share. It represents about 48% uh, target. Um, you know, again, I probably would rush out and buy it immediately because you're in this little downtrend. I would probably be buying around. I would, I would be filling my boots at kind of 45 44 to 47 uh, would be right by. Again, if it breaks out of this uptrend and starts to hit higher, um, that should be a, 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 another signal for me to start getting involved. Um, okay, what is the investment case? I've already talked about a really, really good uh, investment team that took over a, a little, a little <laughs> unbundling of the South African assets of goldfields. So I remember speaking to my colleague at the moment. You know, it wasn't at the time, but it was just afterwards when, when the stock started to rally. I said, you know, the guys at Savannah are doing pretty well. And he said, yeah, we have to leave a bit of juice. 
uh, in the orange for investors. And, and what they've done with that little bit of juice is, is nothing short of incredible. Um, you know, they've, like I said, they've benefited mad, massively from industry consolidation and, and acquisition timing also played well. But these are clever guys running the company. Now, uh, obviously looking at, uh, like I said, the battery electric, uh, battery powered electric vehicle sector, looking for the, the new metals. And, and that for me is, uh, is pretty exciting. Remember on the risk side, this is, uh, mining stock, it's going to be very cyclical. Um, you know, even if they do everything right as a management team, one of the big risks that, that, that we perceive in the stock is the aggressive expansion of other mining houses. So it's kind of what I said, it's game theory in action. Um, you know, it's the prisoner's dilemma. If you, if you get Sabanya expanding a, uh, if you get Sabanya, you know, kind of constrained, not going through the, the typical mining cycle where, you, you know, suddenly, you know, metal prices are higher, so you start sinking shafts into unprofitable ore bodies, or ore bodies that would be unprofitable at lower metal prices, increased supply, the supply floods on stream, suddenly prices collapse, and you're sitting there with all these unprofitable, expensive mines that you've got to shut down. That's generally what happens. But even if they get it right this time, and they just decide they don't, don't want to do that. Other mines can. If Amplatz does it, if, if other PGM miners do it, and they will really boost up production, it is going to hurt Sabania. And that's to an extent outside their control. Um, so that is a big risk for the stock that, that they might be great, but the other, the other, the other management teams are a little bit more less like that will hurt the industry. Of course, production is difficult, labor issues in South Africa are always going to be uh, you know, very, very uh, Difficult, <laughs> if you want to put it that way. Uh, um, so, so that is obviously going to be a concern in the stock as well. And of course, if we get big moves in metal prices, that's going to affect uh, your, your investment if you're holding the shares directly. Um, quick look at the PGM markets. I'm not going to go through all the stuff on the right, but uh, essentially, like two key keys. Okay, so in the PGM basket, one is one metal is platinum. Um, if we look at the 2021 numbers, um, we've had the platinum market in deficit for, for two years. Uh, the platinum market has actually moved into surplus at the moment. Um, so that's the one thing that you should be concerned about. If we look at palladium and rhodium, uh, rhodium uh, for 2021 is predicted to uh, remain in deficit. So at least the palladium is, is uh, predicted to remain in deficit. Rhodium uh, still in deficit, but, but only marginally in deficit as well. So if you're looking at a direct uh, metal investment, uh, I would probably say out of the three, palladium would be the, the place to the place to go. Uh, but yeah, again, this is, this company mines the entire basket, so so it kind of all taken care of. Remember any there's a huge degree of forecast and risk in any um, in any mining company, any commodity. Yeah, if it is, um, you're gonna feed it in the share price. So just a word of warning uh, on that stock as well. Uh, second stock quick. Okay, so this one's another one is store age. So from a giant mining company to, to a very small, very niche, very specific uh, self-storage company. Uh, storage is, uh, it is it is actually the largest uh, storage REIT <laughs> in South Africa. Uh, there are no other storage REITs that I'm aware of, but uh, it's a very, as I said, very, very specific. Um, it's uh, it's a wonderful revenue profile. The company's grown, you know, over the last couple of years. It's really, really managed to gross revenue through acquisitions, but also organically very, very uh, well. Um, it has been very, very profitable this year. As, uh, and part of that, and I'll go through the investment case in a second, but part of that is this is a company that actually thrives in difficult times because when people are moving houses, when people are moving offices, if things need to be put in storage, that's essentially when they really thrive. Um, uh, it was founded by, by Stephen and Gavin Lucas, uh, who still remain the CEO and the finance director. It's got a very deep bench as well. So uh, they are very well supported as, as uh, founders. Um, and you can see it in, in the execution of, of the business as well. Uh, they have been pushing it to the UK since 2017, uh, and their GLA has uh, expanded nicely. Uh, Five-year return up 38%, so only tracking the all-share index, and, and I do believe that this one is more of a, a value play, and I'll show you why in a second. Uh, year to day, uh, at least over one year, up about 17% in, in RAND terms. Uh, nice, uh, you know, remember that's a price return, but nice chunky dividend yield that is fairly secure, in my opinion. Uh, market cap around 6 billion, so much, much smaller stock. Very you know, nice institutional um, uh, holding in the shares, about 75% institutionally held. Um, and just dirt, dirt cheap. I mean, this is sitting on a 4P of 4.18. So if you compare that to some of the tech stocks overseas, like 
Tesla or uh, Amazon or Google, it is, it, is, it is basically going for a song. And this really feeds into the theme that we're seeing uh, that international investors of, you know, international certainly private equity investors and other big listing companies are finding value in our market. It just seems that our private clients are not finding value in our market and, and, not, and, 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 the, and the stocks don't seem to be able to achieve the same valuation as they do overseas. That doesn't mean that the stock isn't worth buying and holding on to even in, in the private space, although it does make your uh, entries and exits a little bit more tricky. Uh, as I said, nice institutional uh, ownership of the stock. PIC has 10% of the business. Uh, Fuert, or Mutual, Alex Forbes, all the big uh, kind of investors are in there. But I've just circled the two. Uh, we've got both Stephen and Gavin Lucas uh, still, uh, you know, obviously founder shareholders. And when you're a founder of a business, I mean, that's something that, uh, you know, they care about this business. And that for me, you know, the principal aging problem is always something that we look at when we, we're trying to select shares. Um, you know, if your management team it doesn't love the business, if your management team is not all in for the business, if it's just a professional manager that's moving in um, and is ready to jump to the next board appointment, that's generally a little bit of a warning sign. I like founder, founder managed businesses. Um, and I also like uh, businesses where the, the, the management team has skin in the game, which they obviously do, being the 13th and 14th biggest shareholder in the business. Um, Remember I said that interest rates are probably increasing, so loan to value uh, is, is pretty decent at uh, 24.4%. Uh, it is, uh, you know, they, I believe they will weather interest rates, but one, because their loan to value is, is not high, they will weather interest rates as well. They have a strong cash position to, to, to handle anything that's coming through. They've also got strong growth coming through. They're also sitting on a 90% occupancy rate. Now compare that to other, if you have to get property exposure, and you should have, you know, if you're looking at a property tactical asset allocation, you should have uh, property exposure in your portfolio. Uh, look at uh, some of our other property companies in South Africa currently and, and imagine how much they are wishing for, for a 90% uh, occupancy rate. Um, what are some other reasons that I like the company? So, like I said, UK exposure, that can be a good thing or a bad thing. I think the UK is going to go through a very difficult time, but at the same time, this is a business that kind of thrives on a little bit of turmoil. Um, so not, I don't think I don't think a bad entry to the UK market. They have got some some pretty fierce competitors over there. Um, so big, I like I mean, I remember big yellow very well. But uh, the interesting part is that as they push into the UK market, um, they do look prime for a revaluation. So um, they they're priced to book sitting at at one point oh five compared to big yellow and. and uh, safe store at 1.75. So even without changing their profile, if they can just achieve the same kind of valuations as international companies, uh, you will see a big kick up in share price. Um, you can see very also average length of stay, you know, 20% of people uh, stay in their storage units for more than three years. And that could be the, the more commercial, you know, 40% of their business is, uh, is commercial. Um, that's in South Africa versus the UK. And, uh, you know, with, with the balance being residential, but yeah, they've got they've got a nice sort of long term lease, and their thirty one percent is less than six months. So uh, you've got a nice spread of durations in, in, in the terms uh, uh, in the times that people rent their, their storage units. Again, adds a little bit of stability, but also the idea that storage units uh, turn over quickly. Now there is something to be said. I mean, we like a, a business overseas called Equinix, which is a data center property reach. I mean, they've got nice long ten year leases with ex escalations. Uh, you know, with with Amazon, AWS, and Google, and it's it's a great business because it's got these long long to tenants. The difference is that, you know, property leases often match what's happening with interest rates. So having the ability to reset your, 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 uh, your rental terms uh, regularly actually helps in a rising interest rate environment as well. So it's not just the, the low LTV that, uh, that, that makes this a, a more attractive property play in a rising rate environment, because from a property which usually like a falling rate environment, um, it's also that they can reset their, their, the, the terms of their, of their, their rentals. Um, they've got a massively diversified tenant base, I think they've got more than 36, 38,000 uh, tenants. So it's not also, you've got one big anchor tenant, if that tenant leaves, you, you're in trouble. Um, it's, it's kind of this little micro business, which also adds a stability to the, the platform. Um, again, you might look at the, the valuation and think, hey, that's even a little bit stretched, but why do these businesses generally trade at much higher valuations to the typical uh, commercial property company? Um, it's because they are essentially a platform business. And if you've ever used the, you know, the storage system, uh, you'll, you'll understand that it is literally just so slick. You go in there, everything happens. You know, there's, you know, when you tag into your storage, you can tag out, alarms go on uh, inside the unit, you get insurance linked in the whole system. A big yellow as well works the same way. It's a very, very sleek system. It's a very, very well-oiled machine. 
and that kind of platform nature of the business does add a little bit of value, in my opinion. Um, yeah, you know, we've talked about repricing excellently. Uh, yeah, also just the, the, the areas their properties are in. Many people know this business just because of where their, their, their units are. Um, so you can see their units are obviously, obviously all in the big major metropolitan uh, uh, sectors, uh, at least uh, hubs. But uh, also just uh, you know in very visible thoroughfares as well. So generally, like highways, people pass them and see that that big branding. I think that is very nice. Uh, the risks, of course, the pandemic is going to be a risk. But again, the diversified tenant space does offset that. Interest rates could be a risk. Rising interest rates are generally not good for property. Again, they have a low LTV and they can reprice their their. Um, their rentals quickly. Uh, weak, okay, weak growth in its markets. So South Africa, South Africa, and um, and the UK. Maybe not the, the most exciting two markets. If I had to, if I had to go across and you thought about what what the US market is doing currently, but also maybe a little bit less competitive markets, easier to do business in, and also a company that I believe will thrive in chaos. Um, Okay, acquisition risk. Okay, they are they are fairly acquisitive and they are looking at uh, doing new transactions and, and they they're not typically a, you know they, they don't do greenfield. Well, they do some greenfield projects, but but really um, they they are happy to buy a business with, with the cash on their balance sheet. Obviously, if they get that wrong, if they can't integrate those new assets uh, correctly, that is a risk. The valuation could be a risk. Obviously, if you see a big devaluation in South African property, for example, or UK property, um, that uh, that will impact the share price. And it will impact the operations of the business, which uh, you know, property is property. People have to rent storage. That's that's the business model. But yes, the underlying asset, which is which is the under, which is the property, will devalue if general property prices fall. Uh, it depends how you're thinking about the stock. If you're just thinking about it as a as a play to the actual physical property or the, the operations that they put on top of it, the special operations that put on top of the property. Uh, but basically yeah, uh, form, but maybe I won't say <laughs> so yes it is a risk and it's uh, being flagged on the risks but overall a, a, a lovely little business uh, that I think uh, works very very well. Uh, and I'm going to run over on some not leave any uh, questions. So I'll quickly run over through the, the wrappers. So I promised how to optimize your local portfolio within a tax wrapper. This is actually a really, really cool thing that we're doing with clients at the moment. Um, so you can put it inside an RA or living in your team, and it's essentially just a personal share portfolio. So you will understand hopefully what a personal share portfolio is because you're returning a JNC power. Um, it's a place where you can hold shares. Now we can put those shares inside your, your retirement product, basically. Now, what does that mean with the retirement wrapper around it? Is it credit? be tax efficient. Um, you know, all your switching inside your, your, your product, so it doesn't generate any capital gains, your dividends don't generate any uh, dividends withholding tax, cash balances in the portfolio don't generate any uh, tax on the interest. So you very, very tax efficient structure. Personal share portfolios compared to the traditional asset management products that go into the pension space are far more transparent. You get to see exactly where your executions happen. If we buy Savania in your portfolio, if we buy Billiton in your portfolio, you can see the price that we bought it, you can see how many we bought it, you can see all of that. The transparency is incredible compared to, hey, I have this unit or that unit trust and I don't know kind of if they've been messing around underneath and yes, they shouldn't be and yes, they've got administrators that are monitoring them, but it's different when you can see your own money working. So incredibly transparent. Costs, very, very cheap. Uh, personal share portfolios obviously don't have this uh, big overhang of like a, a manco that a fund would have. Um, and all those costs feed through to you as the, as the, the ultimate, you know, if you're not paying costs, <laughs> then it's, uh, you know, just putting fees into your performance. So very, very cost efficient as well uh, to run it in a personal share portfolio rather than in a fund directly, as long as you have the right size portfolio. Uh, flexibility, of course, the personal share portfolio allows you to also target more accurate, uh, more accurate uh, exposures. You know, if you Sitting in a, you know, one of the larger asset managers who have a, you know, half a trillion rand in their portfolios, uh, they probably can't go and buy something like storage. You know, the PIC will buy 10% on that will be it. You know, that's 0. 0.0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, something, something of, of, of the PIC's portfolio uh, because uh, they can't make make a meaningful investment in it for you in, in the fund entirely. But you, as an individual, can make a much more targeted, uh, targeted investment. And finally, safety because it's wrapped inside the Pensions Fund Act, uh, you it means that your funds are actually protected from creditors. Uh, you avoid a state duty. There's all the benefits of, of those retirement wrappers as well. Uh, features for 
or ones that we do for clients specifically, uh, we have to take the starting capital over a million rand, which means that obviously with the 350,000 rand or um, 27.5% of your annual income that you can put into a fund, it means we can't take you into a direct local managed portfolio um, with the, you know, without, okay, basically as, as a new investor, we can do we can do it through an ETF-based strategy. You're not gonna get a personal share portfolio in the same way that this works, but uh, absolutely speak to one of our wealth managers if you're interested in, in taking advantage of those benefits, because they will essentially put you in like what I call in the starter portfolio. Uh, every year, you know, if you're a high, you know, a high, high income earner, uh, which is really the people that want to use this to maximize the tax benefits, um, very quickly you'll build up to, to a million bucks and you can convert it into a personal share portfolio. Um, you know, obviously for investors that are older than 55, we have no limits on where we can invest. It's, it's far more flexible, but if you're younger than 55, we've got to, we've got to match the regulation 28 limits. Um, you know, 75% of your total uh, investment funds will be allocated to the share portfolio. The rest has to be parked in a bond-based ETF or cash. Uh, and that's just because of regulation 28 if you're doing it inside the RA. Um, so who should look at the project? Absolutely South Africans with high marginal income tax rates. Now, uh, you, you know, the, the idea behind you doing this, and the reason that we really wanted to do this for clients was, you know, the Section 12J pitch <laughs> that used to come for is, hey, we've got all these terrible VC companies. You know, they're really, really terrible. They're not going to do anything. Their, their, their performance is going to be abysmal. But you get such a good tax rebate, they just need to survive and you'll be okay. And I thought, hey, man, if we can get a decent tax rebate for our high income clients, but then still, um, you know, actually put you into decent things. We've got one undervalued stocks like, like storage, but we've got brand hedge stocks that you can go and invest in as well. Um, we, can, we, can, we can build a, a really decent local portfolio for you and you get the tax rebate, this is kind of like a, a no-brainer. You should definitely do it. Um, so we kind of piloted it. We've had clients going into it for the last couple of months, and uh, it, it's great. It, it works really well. Um, so high marginal income tax rates, that's where you should do it. Uh, if you want to kind of maximize your flexi flexi the investment flexibility of your retirement savings, uh, and you want to efficiently structure your retirement savings, this is a way that you can do it. Um, and then just a quick breakdown of the REG28 rules. Remember, you can't put more than 350,000 rand per year into, into uh, one of these products or 27.5% of the annual income. Your funds cannot be withdrawn until you're 55. So if you are very young, uh, yeah, maybe you want a little bit more flexibility or liquidity. It might not be appropriate. Hey, but if you've got 10 years to retirement, maybe it's a great, it's a great thing. As I said, about 55%, uh, at least about 55 uh, years of age, there really are no limits on this. If you are under, the property exposure has to be limited to 25%. Your equity exposure can't be above 75%, and your offshore exposure is limited to 30%. We do obviously invest the offshore component directly in offshore markets. Um, yeah, and that, uh, if you want to get involved, uh, you literally go to ransource.com, uh, sign up for an account, we need your FICA documents, uh, you'll have a meeting with one of our wealth managers because you've got to take you through the advice process. Uh, you've got account in there list. Thank you very much, Simon. So I, have, I have four minutes to spare for questions. No, dude, you timed it absolute perfect. So I, 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 I got some questions. Firstly, I didn't realize that over the age of 55, Reg 28 was no longer applicable because I'm of the older generation and that's almost me. Yeah, we, we just have to convert it to a living annuity. So there is a bit of yeah. a conversion involved. Just, but, but yes, once once you do that, gotcha. a, a, a lot of a lot a lot of the the, the, the requirements fall away. Yeah. In terms of of could I if I've got an existing Reg 28, could I transfer it across? What's it a section 14 or 24? So yeah, section 14 transfer 100. percent So so that's that's essentially how we're taking inflows into into, into the, the products at the moment. Uh, so at the moment we're supporting uh, both. Uh, yeah, so we're supporting both uh, Sunland Glacier and Momentum Wealth. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you are at Sunland Glacier or Momentum Wealth, it becomes very, very easy to do this. Uh, if you're on one of the other lists, uh, then it's a little bit more complex. We have to do uh, transfers yeah. and that. But yeah, 100%, yeah. uh, yeah, you do the Section 14 transfer, it moves across, and uh, and we essentially just uh, just change. Like I said, we have to, because of retirement funds, we have to go through the formal advice process. Uh, wealth management is very different from stockbroking. So stockbroking, we can do single product sales. Here, we are going to have to deliver your record of advice we're going to have to we're going to have to do a basic needs analysis etc because it might not be appropriate for you but 100 percent if you're more than a million you can just shift across into one of those products oh another important thing that i neglected to mention which i really should have mentioned is that these are currently 
only going to be for, for CAT2 discretionary uh, products that we were offering. And it's just to keep you guys in line with Reg28. Uh, we can't, uh, we, it's definitely in the pipeline of products that we want to deliver to clients. But at the moment, we can't give you access to, uh, to your own retirement you need to go and manage it as you feel. But you get all the advantages of a personal share portfolio, but we have to have a, a portfolio manager running it for you to keep you in line with the Reg. Yeah, and then that's regulation. The 350 a year, so here's something I didn't know. If you put more than so 350, if you stick it in, or 27 and a half percent, that's deducted from your income tax. You pay less tax. Let's say I put 500 in. Um, that extra 150, I can roll that into next year, or the year after, or the year, year, year after. Um, so I, I, I met someone who, what, what he did when he was reaching retirement, he just threw money in. Um, and then he, he had a couple of years where essentially he, he, he got the, 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 the benefits from it. Uh, and I forget what that what, what, what part of the regulation is it's there. Uh, let's go to the stock picks. Uh, two brilliant stocks. I hold both. I got no sweat with those. Uh, two questions coming through. Sabanya, concern around the deals. And I got to say, when Neil Fromman wakes up on Monday and say, I'm buying a mine and on Tuesday pays a billion dollars for it, I, I get a little prickly. But then, of course, he gives me a trading update and says, but you know what? I made a billion dollars in the first in, in the last quarter. So really, I'm taking three months profit and, and buying some Brazilian. Do we take it that Frontman is is a deal maker? And although a billion is a big number in Lonman's life, sorry, in Sabanya's life at this point, not so much. I think, I think we've always got to be careful of, of the acquisition. But remember, mining is also... I 100% take your point. Mining, but mining is also a business that just gets more expensive. The holes just get more expensive and deeper. You have to replenish your body at some point. You have to look at the pipeline. You, you can't just sit back and say, oh, well, you know, it looks like the top of the cycle. Let's just mine these assets until they're gone and then give up. So, so you know, you look at you and you look at the history of the transactions that he's done. Uh, yes. Uh, it is always a concern, but also I think look at the type of transactions that he's doing and the type of minerals that he's doing. If he was going into the state, I think I'd be a lot more concerned than battery. battery. Yeah, and a lot more concerned if he was going into, uh, uh, yeah, sort of a, 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 a it's, it's it, spending it recklessly, buying bankrupt things and doing green fields and stuff. He's he's going into a nice space. These, 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 yeah, these these are in many cases these are established businesses that already have. Uh, now they, again, they're not they're not. This is not highly speculative exploration work that he's doing. So so I'm I'm comfortable. I think I I think you you know as I said it's a it's a mining company and it, you've always got to take it as a mining company and they, you know they they have a history of doing risky deals but the deals have paid off. So yeah. you know with a with a percentage of your portfolio that's why you you have a diversified portfolio. Would I go and stick my entire pension into Spain? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> absolutely not. Nope. Uh, you've got to take it from where it's coming from, but but absolutely, I think the, the management team has done more than enough to prove that they, they deserve your trust. Yeah. Uh, Aubrey, I see your question. I'm assuming you that Jane mailed me earlier in the week. I'm looking for the links. I have three videos which I'll send you links for. Uh, I promise I'll get that tomorrow morning. It's just been a crazy week. The last question, because we have had time. A couple of folks were asking it. Thoughts on Tesla? <laughs> yeah, wow. you left the hard one that's for us. One. So, yeah, wow, that's so hard because, like, I've got my thoughts on Tesla, and Viv's got his thoughts on Tesla. Yeah. So, um, you know, you, you look at Tesla. I mean, you, there's no way that you can justify Tesla's prices as a as a as a car company. It just it's just not. I mean, even if it produces, you know, like, it's just it, there's there's no way that you it will ever match that valuation as a car company. The fact is. You're kind of buying it to Elon Musk, you're buying it as a tech company and, and you're pricing all the future tech that it ever develops into it. And there is some really exciting stuff. One of, one of it is the, the idea that there's, you know, they have the data behind the, all the autonomous driving. If he really does launch a humanoid robot that is only 75 kilograms, but he has all the mapping technology that this thing can walk around and, and autonomously pilot itself, I mean, how do you put a value on that? I mean, you, it's, it's, it's impossible. I mean. You, you, you buy pie in the sky. This is not something that you're looking at the earnings going, hey, look at look at what they're actually producing. It's it's a, it's a wonderful story, and I think the reason that people are prepared to pay up for it is that he does have a he does have a history of executing on, on the wild promises that he makes. When he says something, it happens, and that's uh, in, many, in many cases, and that's why he's able to able to do what he does. Uh, I don't personally hold Tesla. We do have clients that hold. Them. 
a lot of uh, a lot of Tesla, and Bert does run a mini UK, uh, tech basket, which uh, looks specifically at high risk, exciting tech stocks. That's ten tech stocks. Tesla is one of his ten, 10 tech stocks. I don't hold it in my uh, global managed portfolio because uh, it's just outside of mandate. It's it's too speculative uh, a position for me to hold when people are giving me their money to put as an offshore nest egg in case everything hits the fan. I'm not going to go and stick that in Tesla. Yeah, but, but and Viv does call it a tech stock, and you're 100% right. That's what it is. And when I first spoke to him on my show about it, it was just before the split, and everyone gave him tons of hell for it, and the stock is up 5x. So, so far, it, it's playing as a tech stock, and I agree with you. I mean, they have got hundreds of thousands of people out there doing beta testing for them on autonomous driving. You know, Waymo has just launched two cars in New York. Tesla's probably got a thousand cars in New York. Waymo's got, oh, we've got two. Very exciting. Ladies and gents, I'm going to park it there because we have hit uh, our time. Uh, Gary is on the Twitch. Is Gary Boyson. Of course, you can find him there. Uh, Ryan Swiss. Gary, always appreciate the time. Always appreciate the content. Ladies and gents, appreciate your time this evening. Everyone, stay safe. Look after yourself. And if you can, look after somebody else as well. Cheers all. So, <laughs> let's, let's go. And so what I was asked to, to talk about was uh, one, just, just explore what uh, to expect from the securities broker. Uh, we can't really call them stockbrokers anymore because uh, we do so much more than just shares. We do currencies and commodities and uh, all sorts of fancy derivatives. So, so yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about what you can maybe expect from a securities broker. Should provide a nice little introduction uh, to who we are if you, if you don't know us. And uh, then I'll go to some market trends, things that we're watching. Um, with that, uh, I've got uh, two stock picks that, that we can do. And then uh, we'll just finish off with a, a bit of structuring, uh, which is essentially how, how you can uh, basically maximize your tax rebate by using uh, an RA wrapper to, to stick your personal share portfolio inside it. So that's kind of the, the format that we're going to go through. So starting with what to expect from your stock broker, which should have been the scariest broker. Um, and all I can really say is, uh, I can kind of give you a, a little picture of, of what we do um, as, as a business. And, uh, and and I suppose we've done it for, I mean, I've been in the industry last 12, 13, almost 14, 15 years now. And, and I can see it's changed immensely over the period. And uh, kind of what, what a securities broker, what a stock broker does essentially is, is plug you as the, uh, as the investor uh, into financial market products and instruments. And uh, these are international. And, and they're local, they're international, they're all over. So, so it's it's yes it's it's listed JSC securities it's it's being able to buy a share of a company uh, but it's also about being able to buy shares of companies that are not listed on our exchange it's also about being able to hedge your currency exposure it's also about being able to speculate on oil and sugar and orange juice and all these uh, very exotic instruments and, and to do that uh, a stockbroker basically relies on product providers so I've got a whole lot of different product providers up here I've also got kind of media houses um, so that's the one aspect of stockbroking I suppose the other aspect is then the level of service that you require because every every stockbroker and every securities broker at least um, and every client uh, you know has a different has a different requirement and a, diff a different uh, ability to service their clients so the way that we've broken down our business is, is really into different different units and I'll kind of talk about the, the first three on, on the left hand side which is now online trading now now online trading is very much that's the the, the kind of stockbroking service or, or securities broking service when you're generally an experienced investor, you know what you're doing and you really just want a platform, you want an electronic system so that your costs are, can be kept really, really low. There's no real relationship uh, other than the digital relationship that you're creating with your clients. Um, and you essentially do everything. So I, I sometimes use a sailing metaphor, sometimes I use a fishing metaphor. So I use a fishing metaphor today. This is like you've come to us and we're selling you a fishing rod. You might get fish, you might not get fish, but you're taking the fishing rod and you're going to go cast off and, and see if you can catch fish. We're not going to teach you how to fish either. Now, private broking, a little bit different. This is kind of the old school uh, service that, that, that clients used to get uh, you know, a couple of decades ago. It was, was the standard way that you would interact with your securities broker. Uh, it's that high touch service. It's, it's someone that really is in your corner, that's uh, providing you research, they're watching your portfolio, they're monitoring, and they're essentially assisting you with your investment decisions. So in, in the fishing metaphor here, um, they're not quite catching, but you've got kind of almost a professional coach, or you've got someone that you're fishing with, you've got your boat sitting there casting off the side of the boat, off the shore. Um, and then finally, managed portfolios. So this is a, a different type of stockbroking. It's still run in personal share portfolios. It's still run by stockbroking platforms, run by list platforms. 
but uh, essentially here you, you take discretion over a client's assets and we give you hopefully the investment product that you're looking for. So uh, that in the fishing metaphor is we're just giving you a fish and you get to eat the fish. So, so that's kind of the thing. I mean, we have a couple other businesses as well, wealth management, that's much more holistic, that involves all your structuring. Tax free savings accounts is, a, is an element of it, uh, which is again, it's just a type of wrapper that you can access financial markets through. And we do structured products and offshore transfers, which are kind of interesting kind of, you know, structured products, kind of credit notes mixed with derivatives, also a very exotic instrument, but very, very specialist. And that's why we strip it out as a separate uh, provider. So. How do we rank? As Simon said, we, we did rank top uh, and top securities broker this year, uh, which I'm really proud of because you know we, we are a much smaller operation than a, a lot of these other guys. Uh, you know, most of these are banks and listed uh, listed entities that giant firms, and, and we're just a, a, a small broker that uh, that is fairly new. I mean, we we only launched in 2015, so we're a very new player in the market as well. So I'm really happy that uh, that the, the firm has done so well. And also, I think when when you're dealing with securities broking, it's such an obscure Secure um, thing. It's it's quite it's quite difficult sometimes to realize when you're getting good service as a client. You know, especially if you're in a discretion portfolio, you might not be aware of the fees that you charge. So have to have an independent house uh, like Intelidex kind of uh, vetting uh, all the different uh, uh, providers. I think is is very valuable to the public. Um, so yeah, as Simon said, we, we kind of picked up another three awards this year, top tax savings account, people's choice and overall broker. We have uh, one of them in 2019 as well. Um, and how these, so, so the reason I'm kind of telling you about this is how, how the, the betting process works. And it's an incredibly uh, detailed betting process. And it measures us, okay, one, it surveys all our clients and they have to tell, tell, tell Intellidex exactly what's going on. Um, but they also, you know, shop us, they come and open fake accounts, and then we've got to kind of tell them all about our risk structures and how we're working with the different product providers. So it is very robust, but the way that they almost silo stockbroking and securities broking, they, they divide it into these four areas. So if you are just an online trader and you're trading through one of the big platforms, all you really care about is, is probably value for money. So when I say value for money, you're just looking for a very low cost solution um, that you can execute and enter the market. So the other thing that you're looking for as well is probably the availability of trading tools. How wide a spread of instruments can, can you invest in? Can you get those complex derivatives? Are you able to invest offshore? What markets can you access? Can you access structures in India? Can you trade orange juice in Miami? Can you do all of that? And that is very important. It's what, what is the availability of tools that you want. Um, of course, then all the research and support tools. So if you are trading yourself, if you're, you're taking control of your portfolio yourself, I mean, you need research, trust me. You, you, to fly blind into, into financial markets these days is very, very dangerous. So all the education tools, that's also the responsibility of the broker. Now, big online platforms, online, our online trading business as well. We do it through meetings like this, webinars, regular webinars, um, you know, all those kind of one-to-many touch points. Um, whereas if, you, if you've got kind of a private broking relationship, then you really, you, you, that, that service is delivered to, directly to you. And it's, uh, that private broker essentially becomes this one point of contact for you um, across, uh, across a, a huge swath of financial instruments. And he's almost like your GP and he's got all these specialists that he can draw knowledge from, but he's your, your single point of contract. And what that does is it helps kind of respond to this and transparency because while you're trying to access all of these securities, you obviously want to do it in the most pleasant way possible. And that's always to, to have someone holding your hand as you do it. So those are kind of the, 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 the areas that, that securities broking, uh, I think that is important to kind of hit in securities broking. Uh, the only other thing I'll say is, is, is the one thing I've noticed as well over the last say, 15 years is just the complexity of what is required as a stockbroker has, has increased, uh, or securities broker at least, has, has increased dramatically. There's, there's so much more core, the, 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 the instruments that we're dealing with are now so much more complicated. And also your, your clients are coming with far more complex questions just because of the, the I suppose the, uh, the nature of the, uh, the, the availability of information. But we're also seeing that the clients themselves are, are far more savvy than they were in the past. I remember 10 years ago, a client would, would come to you and say, oh, yeah, I'm looking at this stock, I like uh, Cura because I like schools. You know, and that would be the whole investment process. Now with the internet, with the blogs, with all the financial training and media that, that is around, uh, we find that uh, the clients that we're dealing with and the, and the general level of knowledge across the whole uh, spectrum of, of, of clients, the, of small clients to the large clients, is, is far greater than it was a couple of, let's say, a decade ago. So I'd say that's one of the other big changes that we've seen in the market. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of a little breakdown of what you should expect from a stockbroker. But 